Um, dear friends, it's really my pleasure um, to have uh, with us uh, my dear friend for you know, about 20, 25 years, Professor Mehmet Zalili. Uh, we've spent a lot of good time together teaching, training all over the world. And especially with these webinars, he's been a, a, a really a force who's pushed us in doing many things. He's made us write chapters and um, you know, papers and guidelines. And you know, that all has worked really well for people all over the world. So I'm grateful. Mehmet, you're doing a great job. So Mehmet today is going to be talking about, um, he's the chair of the WFNS Fine Committee, and uh, he's going to be talking about um, fusion versus non-fusion. Mehmet, all yours. Yes, I'm sharing my screen. Good. Now, uh, in this talk, uh, I will try to discuss uh, when to decompose and when to fuse in lumbar spine stenosis. This is a very hot topic. Actually, in practice, I, I'm seeing that uh, many uh, spine surgeons are uh, trying to uh, fuse uh, many of the cases of lumbar spine stenosis. First, some uh, background uh, information about lumbar spine stenosis. Stenosis or narrowing. Probably narrowing is, is a better term. Stenosis term comes from myelography era. Uh, and the main problem with this disease is neurogenic claudication. Low back pain uh, may uh, be added to that or not. There are congenital type, which is more common in younger ages and uh, more very more common is degenerative disease acquired ones are in the older ages. There are anatomical terms like central stenosis, lateral or foraminal stenosis, and the frequency uh, of the levels is uh, most common is L45, uh, then the second most common 3-4, then 2-3, and L5-1, quite less common in the lumbar spine. The, the motion segment terminology is, is, uh, is uh, something that the disc space and adjacent end plates and two facet joints uh, uh, compose the motion segment. And if you look at the uh, degeneration phases, there are mainly three phases described by Kirkaldi and Willis, dysfunctional phase, unstable phase, and stabilization phase. This is the graph that we, we are having that uh, first dysfunctional, unstable, and rest stabilization. If you look at here, uh, for the rest uh, during the rest stabilization phase, we must not do any fusion surgery. Just the compression is, it will be okay. Uh, but in uh, one per, uh, patient, there may be different levels, which one level is unstable, the other level is restabilization phase, another level may be dysfunctional phase. Normal mobile segment is like this, but if it is degenerated, then the disc height is decreased, ligaments laxed, and facet joints overloaded. In fact, there is no uh, ligament uh, hypertrophy because of uh, ligaments laxed uh, and shortened. Uh, we see the ligaments like they are hypertrophic. Uh, this table explains how we can uh, um, call a stenosis like soft stenosis, after a while a dynamic stenosis, and uh, after some restabilization phase, a heart stenosis. These are relatively uh, pathological uh, terminology, not, uh, cannot define uh, our daily practice every time. Surgical indications are mostly relative, almost more than 95% neurogenic claudication. Absolute indication is cauda equina syndrome. It's not very common. It's quite uh, rare. This patient, a 32 years old male, 
came to me with a urinary incontinence for five days and perianal sensor loss. It was a real cauda equina syndrome, but this patient has a unique feature. It, it is a congenital canal narrowing. There is almost no pedicles or very short pedicles. Uh, surgical uh, surgery is absolute indica indication. There are mainly two techniques. One is the decompression, open or MIS techniques. The other one is decompression plus fusion. Uh, it may be done without instrumentation or with a pedicle screw fixation uh, plus interbody fusion or postural fusion. In the past, we used to do total laminectomies. Then we tried to make fenestrations. Uh, so then we, are, we were preserving the spinous process and, 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 and a part of the lamina uh, on both sides. Uh, but we, uh, to, to do that, we were opening uh, the muscles, uh, retracting the muscles on both sides. This is uh, one typical fenestration, postoperative AP film of fenestrations. Then the recent trend is to protect ligaments, facet, and avoid instability by looking the uh, canal uh, from one side, so universal approach and bilateral decompression. This is the new trend. It may be done by a microsurgical technique or tube guided surgery, uh, which I had uh, explained that in other uh, webinars. Tube guided surgery is uh, facilitates our uh, view. Uh, you can either use endoscope or microscope. Uh, you can make uh, this is two levels decompression before surgery and after surgery with unilateral approach from one side only. Even four levels is possible. This is. Uh, uh, preoperative films of that patient, uh, four levels, and this is postoperative films. Yes, preoperative and postoperative, pre post uh, We must, however, uh, stress the uh, facts about the MIS decompressions. Um, this is an effective and safe choice for surgical decompression. However, it is not superior to the open decompression in terms of clinical outcomes. If you look at many uh, good uh, clinical series, there is not much difference with clinical outcomes. However, hospital stay and return to work are shorter. Infection rate is less. This is quite well uh, shown in, in many studies. And small modification of conventional instruments and uh, uh, the one of the advantages of tube guided surgery is the learning time is shorter. When fusion is necessary, uh, somebody says if you create iatrogenic instability, extensive facet resection, and or three levels total laminectomy, degenerative listasis plus back pain, degenerative scoliosis plus back pain, flat back syndrome, these are the uh, indications for fusion. Probably this is right, but we will discuss it. Uh, there is one term uh, which I like to use, the, uh, the complex lumbar spine sessions with degenerative listasis, scoliosis, kyphosis, previous lumbar spine surgery, postoperative adjust segment stenosis, and radiological instability. So this is a typical case of flat back syndrome. This is the lateral X-ray of that lady uh, and spine stenosis. Uh, and probably we should make a 4-5 osteotomy and tell if instrumented fixation and fusion uh, decompression. Uh, what are the surgical op options for degenerative listes and stenosis? We can still make some decompression alone so in some cases. Decompression plus fusion in different techniques, decompression plus dynamic fixation. Uh, what is the 
The compassion alone indications in degenerative states and stenosis patients, if it is a stable segment with osteophytes, anterior stasis less than three millimeter on dynamic radiograms and significant loss of this space, probably less than two millimeter disc height and no movement. These cases, although there is some degenerative diseases are uh, uh, candidates for the compassion alone surgery. What about the compassion and instrumented fusion in degenerative diseases? If the anterior disease is more than three millimeter mobility in dynamic films, preserved disc height, sagittalization of the facet joints, no osteophytes, osteoporosis, females, obesity, hyperlordosis, laminectomy on more than three levels, and additional discectomy. Uh, I will not mention about the techniques used. Uh, this is somewhat far from my object on, on this uh, uh, talk. Uh, but uh, I must mention dynamic fixation. Uh, some surgeons prefer to use it to avoid the problems of fusion and the morbidity and adjust segment degeneration. But there are still uh, some uh, cautious uh, things that uh, do, do, do they really uh, prevent a just segment degeneration or not? We don't know yet. What about the evidence for surgery? Actually, although uh, my talk aims to, to make fusion or not, we, we can first uh, ask if there is a need for surgery, any surgery, even the compassion. Uh, so this study from 2008, uh, a, a well-designed randomized cohort study with sport investigator and very uh, famous uh, orthos, ortho, orthospine surgeon Weinstein uh, 289 patients randomized cohort surgery is superior to non-surgical treatment and uh, they the, uh, it, it is probably uh, an early study which is stressing the surgery is superior this from 2017 uh, collecting five studies comparing surgical versus non-surgical treatment 643 patients uh, they had no conclusion regarding which treatment is better. However, side effects of surgical groups are between 10 and 21, 24%. So complications are quite much uh, with the surgery than the conservative treatments. So then they decided well-designed designed studies are necessary. Another study from 2016 uh, with conservatively treated patients, three year follow up, they say that 30% sub subjective improvement of symptoms without any treatment. 70% symptoms remained unchanged, worsened, or required sur surgical treatment. So we can tell that uh, even uh, with conservative treatment or follow-up, simple follow-up, one-third of the patients may improve by the time. So it is the uh, WFNS uh, spine committee's uh, recommendations about the natural course. Approximately 30% of patients with lumbar spine stenosis are expected to worsen but 30% may improve with conservative measures. So predictive signs and symptoms that they will worsen are dural sac cross-sectional area less than 50 millimeters uh, square, presence of reticular symptoms and back pain, uh, degenerative listasis and or scoliosis, and sem symptom duration uh, less uh, more than one year. These are predictive signs that the patient may uh, worsen by the time. What about the evidence for fusion surgery? Shall we 
choose the competitive surgery or fusion surgery. One study from 2015, a meta-analysis saying that the compression plus fusion is not more effective than the compression alone. Another uh, statement they have uh, shared in conclusions that the interspinous process spacer devices result in higher reoperation rates than bony decompression. So they are, they say that it, these devices are not good. In, in Epstein's 2016 study, a retrospective analysis in elderly patients, mean age 72, she says that direct radiograms of the geriatric patients may show great one or two diseases. It doesn't mean they are unstable. They may have fused and not necessary to instrument. 80% of instrument fissures at this age group require reoperation in five years. Even if there is instability, uh, they rarely need instrumentation and uh, she uh, stresses that the one to two level non-instrument fusion is better than instrument fusion. It's something with uh, uh, not very high evidence level. Sorry, Mehmet. Yeah. Your, your voice is uh, just, there's a lot of noise. Maybe it's your, the microphone that you're using. Could you just uh, adjust it a bit? Uh, is it just the microphone? Just see what you're, yeah, that, no, but there is some noise along with your voice. So let's see. Okay. Okay. So just again, uh, we do that. Okay. Sorry. Sorry for that. I'm sorry. Uh, is sorry, it again? You need to go back on display setting. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Sorry, sorry to bother. This, this study from uh, a, a Swedish group, uh, which is one of the most cited publication from 2016, is saying that the compression plus fusion surgery did not result in better clinical outcomes at two years and five years than did the compression surgery alone. So there is no difference at all, which is a level one evidence, a randomized controlled trial of fusion surgery or decompression surgery. Uh, another study, 2018, uh, one level lumbar spinal stenosis and degenerative disease at L4-5 level only. They have divided three groups from the compression alone, the compression plus fusion, the compression plus stabilization. 85 patients randomized, total follow-up five years, no difference in outcomes at one and five years. And fusion and stabilization group had more blood loss, longer surgical duration, and longer hospital stay. And they concluded that the additional instrumentation for low-grade agentic listasis did not result in super result, uh, outcomes uh, to the compassion alone. Uh, this study uh, by Salman uh, and our group, uh, WFNS spine committee recommendations, uh, there are three recent uh, compar comparison studies, uh, RCTs, uh, which shows that there is no difference between fusion and the compassion. So, these are our recommendations. And we say that in patients with lumbar spine stenosis and no sign or symptoms of instability and predominant leg pain, the compression alone is recommended. Uh, if it is a stable spondylate stasis, we use this term uh, to define that uh, the disc height is very low and there are osteophytes and there is no movement uh, with the flexion extension films. Fusion is not mandatory and the compression alone is suggested. However, unstable spondylolisthesis cases with symptoms may, re may require fusion. We are not suggesting that they must be fused. 
There is no consensus if the main complaint is mechanical axial low back pain, which is more than leg pain, the patient may benefit from a fusion surgery. Patients with lumbar spine syndrome and lots of sagittal balance, if symptomatic, may benefit from the compression fixation and deformity correction study surgery. Fusion may be advisable in patients who undergo bilateral facetectomy of more than 50% and bilateral discectomies. And facet joint effusion alone is not proven to correlate with stability. These are our recommendations. But uh, I like this study. And I wanted to show this. This, this Kulkarni uh, uh, orthopedic spine surgeon from India, uh, a very recent paper, uh, he has uh, graded the clinical factors and radiological factors and technical factors. And he says that uh, if there is mechanical back pain, the score is two. Age younger is one, segmental kyphosis is 1.5, segmental dynamic listeres is one point, this kite is preserved one point. So then if the points are more than 5.5, this is this indicates instability, and those cases should better go to fusion surgery. This is one scoring system to help our decision making in lumbar spine stenosis, whether we have to fuse or not. In conclusion, non-surgical treatment for lumbar spine Fair enough. Yes, ma'am. Did, did, you, did you hear this, this score yes, system? Yes, yes, we did. Okay. So then in conclusion, non-surgical treatment for lumbar spine stenosis may still be a good, good option for many patients. The compression is the basis of our uh, surgery. Uh, indications are mostly relative indication just for claudication and to increase the quality of life of the patients. Uh, unilateral approach, bilateral decompression is co currently most popular surgery, but its value is not validated yet, unfortunately. MIS techniques for spine centers have some advantages, but in the long term, the outcomes are same with uh, open surgeries. Fusion is an option, especially when listasis or instability are present, but indications remain controversial. And in degenerative listasis, the compression without fusion is still possible. And decision making. For complex spine stenosis is more difficult. And fusion indications, back pain, overt instability, preserved disc height, and facet degeneration uh, may be uh, like those, but still not very clear. Better we must perform shorter fusions, and fusion surgery has more complications, up to 25% complication rate. There is no good correlation between radiology and symptoms, and our decision must be based on our clinical symptoms, not uh, the radiology. This is uh, my own algorithm for uh, neurogenic claudication and lumbar spine stenosis. First question must be if there is a back pain. If there is no back pain, just a compassion. Whether you see a uh, list stages or not, doesn't matter. With back pain, if there is no instability, you can just try facet injection, sacroiliac joint injection, brace and exercises, so conservative measures. If there is good benefit, you can uh, make the patient as candidate for the compassion only. If no benefit, so then the compassion plus fusion may be indicated. It, a patient with back pain and significant radiologic instability, uh, that patient may go to the compression plus fusion. Okay, I thank you for listening to me. Uh, our Istanbul Spine Masters has been postponed to next year, September 16 to 19, 2021. Thank you for listening to me.
Thank you, ma'am. That's a brilliant talk. Uh, Nicola, you'd like to take over? Sorry, um, since you, Nicola, wasn't there, so I just took the liberty of starting this. Uh, Thanks. Professor Doug Orr is here as well. Uh, Stacy is here to present as well. So I think we're going to have good fun. Atul Gol, I can see in the audience as well. So, um, uh, Nicola, all yours. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for taking over, Salman. And um, again, apologies for being late. I did not calculate the one hour back, and that's the reason. Excuse me for that. Um, so, um, Mehmet, um, at least uh, the part that, I, that I, I've seen, a uh, good and very comprehensive talk, as usual. And thank you so much for that. Um, I will uh, have uh, just. Uh, I will ask you a few questions if you if you don't mind. Uh, I don't see any questions in the uh, group chat, so I'm gonna take the liberty to ask you. First, um, I completely agree with you and with your algorithm that if there is no back pain, um, probably simple decompression will be uh, will be good, and that's my practice as well. And uh, Whatever I see, unless it's really striking uh, radiological instability, then I will also just simply decompress. But my question is, if you still have some concerns whether there is decompression or uh, whether there is uh, instability or not, do you follow these uh, patients with dynamic um, uh, x-rays post uh, fix, post uh, decompression, do you do standing x-rays just to see if there is any instability? At what stage do you do that? And my next question is, if there is only back pain, uh, do you consider sending these patients for ablation procedures? And what's your practice with that? Yeah. Yeah. In my algorithm, I have shown some uh, injections and conservative measures. If there is a back pain predominantly, but no instability signs, so then those patients may first get some injections uh, or conservative treatments. Uh, if it doesn't work, then uh, they may be candidates for surgery. Uh, if, for your question about the uh, following patients with dynamic films uh, I don't do that actually uh, uh, because in in no case uh, we see that uh, significant instability develops I mean uh, great more than grade two disease I didn't see in degenerative diseases uh, although somebody mentions that it may happen but I didn't see any uh, great three. Uh, so, uh, if, however, the patient is not satisfied uh, we, uh, uh, because of the back pain mostly, we must evaluate the patient once again. That that is the uh, that is my policy. Okay, um, I personally seen a few. Uh, um, patients where I've seen radiological uh, signs suggesting possible instability, but as you said, no back pain, and I have just decompressed. And then on the follow-ups, not so many of them, but I have, I've seen a few which developed lately um, more radiological and also clinical signs of instability, and I had to go back and fuse. Maybe I have to uh, audit my practice and see really what is the percentage of that. Not so many, but I have seen a few cases where um, I've done post-operative um, standing x-rays on the first follow-up, which is normally six weeks for me. And then I've seen more listasis than it had been before. And the patient is not happy with back pain, which developed after the surgery and persisted and sometimes uh, got worse. And uh, not so many, but a few cases I had to go back and, and, and fuse. Right. Yeah, it is. It is possible. And, and then if I inject and if they have a short term uh, relief for my uh, for my back pain only patients, I consider sending them for ablation procedure. And some of them just get away with ablation without fusion. And that's why I what is some of them, Nicolay, what percentage would get better? Right. So I basically uh, would go and send uh, for ablation and I do ablation and endoscopic ablation myself. 
and I see I have not audited my practice as yet what exactly percentage, but surely over 50% of them will get good outcome for their back pain, which is still significant for me because I, um, uh, I do a very minor day procedure and they get away without anything more significant like fusion. Okay. If I might add a couple of things. Um, one thing that, that wasn't brought up, the Gogawala study that you mentioned, Mehmet, specifically excluded anybody with an unstable spondylolisthesis. Yeah. So that if they had uh, motion either on flexion extension or between uh, supine and standing imaging, they were not entered into that study. So that's Gogoala study was all stable spondylolisthesis. And they actually did show in a couple of the secondary outcomes, improved outcome with fusion. So that's not one that, that I think you can say it didn't show a, a benefit. It certainly did for, but not in the primary, um, the primary outcome, which was the SF36. Um, a study that, that I, I remember, it's one that I saw um, Keith Bridwell present um, but never publish. Um, he did one of the early studies looking at laminectomy alone versus laminectomy and fusion and showed a benefit to fusion as opposed to laminectomy. Um, but what was interesting is he went back and he subgrouped who did better, like who did well amongst the non-fusion patients. And the, the ones I remember is older patients. So again, you're older than 70. Um, the loss of disc height was a predictor of good outcome of, of decompression alone. But the other one that doesn't get mentioned a lot was actually um, the slope of the L4 superior end plate. If the L4 superior end plate is parallel to the floor, they had a very low, they had a very good outcome with decompression alone. If it was sloped more than 10 degrees, they had a very bad outcome. Um, so those are a couple of things that I, I, I add into my decision uh, to decide whether to fuse somebody or not. Thank you. Good comments. Thank you. What do you think about the, that scoring system, Doc? Um, I guess it's one of those ones that, that we're probably all mentally doing that in our heads anyway. We just never got bothered to put numbers to it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't, he, he, that system is good. out there, but it hasn't been tested. Uh, I looked at this scoring system and I uh, used it in a couple of my patients. I think we can improve it further. And I spoke to Arvind about it. Um, and I think it's possible that it can be improved further to refine it a little. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Mehmet, any more comments? Any questions from the audience? There were a couple on the chat I saw. Yeah, so uh, patient who have suffered stages, unstable and restabilization, how would you approach this group of patients? Sorry? Mehmet is talking about uh, patients who have uh, different stage, stages, i.e. unstable and then restabilize. So yeah. how would you approach those patients? This is actually quite common. Um, uh, one of the uh, disadvantages of fusion surgery is adjacent level disease. So it's more common uh, if you do uh, multiple levels, adjacent level disease. Uh, so uh, because of that, uh, you must uh, do your fusion as short as possible. Uh, or uh, a dynamic fixation may be used. Uh, for different stages, for the other level, you can make just uh, just uh, injections. You can you can stay conservative for the other levels. You don't need to uh, correct all the degeneration. Actually, degeneration is something normal. Probably we will have in the future uh, some other. Uh, management tools for against degeneration we will do it better uh, but uh, all the degeneration should not be treated uh, by uh, surgeons especially remember there's another question what about severe stenosis with facet degeneration if it's more than two levels would you suggest fixation fusion in those patients with the, you know, the facet sign that you have? 
uh, with arthropathy and on top of it, severe uh, facet degeneration. So would you fuse these patients or would you consider just decompressing? Yeah. Arvind Kulkarni has mentioned this also. Uh, he is telling that uh, it is unfeasible uh, to uh, make a good decompression without removing facet joints. Uh, is there such cases really? It is. It depends on your surgical technique. So I don't agree with that point. Uh, he has then pointed that 1.5. But it, uh, having, having said that, only uh, removing facets in two levels doesn't mean that it is really unstable after surgery. Uh, so it is just 1.5. He was saying that five, it must be 5.5. There is research suggesting that if you keep the midline structures, let's say if you go on unilateral, if you keep the midline structures, if you keep the disc, even if you remove one facet completely in the lumbar spine, and the chances of, uh, of developing instability uh, is less than 2%. So we still, and also that also depends on other factors like disc height and uh, uh, the mobility of the disc, obviously. But uh, yeah, so it's, the facet is important that if we can keep it, maybe it's good, but I don't know right. what you think about this moment. Yes. And again, yeah, actually, again, for number of not, levels. Mehmet, for number of levels that you do laminectomy, would you consider fusing them? Some um, biomechanical studies are saying that three levels. Some others saying two levels. But uh, uh, if it is together with laminectomy, total laminectomy, then it's really very important. I don't think there is good evidence that uh, with unilateral approach, uh, bilateral decompression, and uh, sometimes you can jeopardize one, one facet joint or two facet joints. Uh, do they really uh, make too, too much uh, instability? We don't know that. Okay, and there's another, another question regarding uh, non instrumented fusion. fusion. Uh, is it still used and is it worth it? And are there complications associated with non-instrumented fusion? This is the Epstein study. <laughs> Actually, she was uh, stressing that non-instrumented fusion is better for elderly patients for more than 70 years old. Uh, but uh, uh, there are still uh, surgeons using that. I don't use any non-instrumented fusion. Okay. There's another question regarding uh, what is your experience with failed lumbar spine syndrome after treatment of diseases? Uh, how would you decide uh, pain control measures, lumbar neurostimulators? How would you treat these patients that you've operated for diseases and then they come with failed um, uh, lumbar spine syndrome? Um, this is a good question, but it, it, uh, <laughs> to answer that question requires another talk, another one hour. <laughs> um, th th there are uh, many aspects of it. Uh, if, if the main problem is a neuropathic pain, you can start with uh, the gabapentin or pregabalin, and then stimulator must be the last uh, resort. Actually, uh, although uh, some people are very fan of stimulators, but uh, their effect uh, diminishes by the time. And after one year, 50% of them are effective. Uh, so then uh, I try to find the main source of the pain mostly and uh, try to... Uh, rehabilitate the chronic pain behavior together with psychiatrists. It is one of the main problems of that chronic pain patients. And it is, it is, it has a, it needs a very multidisciplinary approach, actually. 
Okay, there, you, you, you know, in, in your talk, you talked about obesity and females uh, are as one of the factors. So how, how would obesity and females make a difference? <laughs> it, they, uh, I am not uh, sure for that, but some studies are saying that uh, in the female patients, uh, the uh, ratio of instability is much more than the males. This is because of that. I don't know the explanation of that. Okay. All right. Um, Doug, have you got any comments? Um, a couple. Um, I hate the term failed surgery syndrome. Um, it, it doesn't, it isn't a diagnosis. Um, and in patients who have bad results from surgery, you need to figure out why they had a bad result. Um, is that they had a surgery that didn't work, like the goals of surgery weren't accomplished. They didn't adequately decompress um, or a fusion that didn't heal. Um, is it somebody who should never have had a surgery in the first place? A chronic pain patient who had an, an MRI abnormality, um, but really the pain pattern didn't fit. Um, and I think in the, the biggest thing of, of in the quote failed surgery syndrome patient is to figure out why they failed. Um, and, and then you'll find out it wasn't the surgery failed, it was something else. Um, and that's, I think, the other one I wanted to mention, um, when people talk about lumbar stenosis and back pain and whether decompression alone will treat back pain, you have to look at the pattern of the back pain. So if you have somebody who has a true mechanical back pain, so pain made worse with changing positions, Pain made, it's equally worse with any loading of the spine. So sitting is equivalent to standing. Those patients, that's a mechanical back pain. The other back pain that a lot of these patients will get is, is what is essentially a claudicant back pain. If they are sitting, they have no back pain. If they stand or walk for a prolonged period of time, they have a back pain that goes away immediately upon sitting down. These are patients who are getting back pain because of their compensatory mechanism for their stenosis. They're leaning forward, they're, overla they're overloading their back muscles. Um, these are also patients who are fine pushing a shopping cart. They're, they don't have back pain when they're pushing a shopping cart or, or using a walking stick. Those are patients, that pattern of back pain will get better with the decompression alone. Okay, I think it's a very valid point. I totally agree. Atul, have you got any comments? Uh, can we unmute Atul and get his opinion on, in this? Maurizio is here as well, so. Uh, Imad, can you please unmute at all? Okay, Salman, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <clears throat> See, uh, I enjoyed the lecture, but you know, I'm a little bit uh, surprised that my recent work on lumbar canal stenosis was not quoted by my dear friend, Mehmet, and not, you know, the concepts in my article were not at all touched. You see, my concept is very clear and I have no doubt. Salman, you better listen what I'm saying. That lumbar canal stenosis is a phenomena related to lifelong standing human position. And the muscles of the back which are controlling the lifelong sitting position, abuse, disuse, and misuse of those muscles are the bottom line of creation of lumbar canal stenosis and degenerative spine in general. So my concept is that vertical instability, which is not recognized by radiology at all, you do whatever dynamic imaging or flexion, extension, you do whatever, is not recognized by imaging, is the basis or the nodal point of pathogenesis of lumbar canal stenosis. So that is one issue. My concept is absolutely clear that decompression is a negative treatment. Only fixation, multi-segmental fixation is the treatment for lumbar canal stenosis. And I wish, and I hope you refer to my publications, which are several in the recent past, and little bit, I know the experts of lumbar canal stenosis and spine are sitting right in front of me, but I will like all of you to have a look at those papers, try to understand what concepts I'm 
proposing, whatever, whether you want to read or whether you want to follow, that is different. But as far as I am concerned, absolutely clear that only fixation is the treatment. Decompression of any kind, whether you want to do midline decompression, whether you want to do facetal decompression, is a negative form of treatment. So that is my comment. Salma. Yeah, okay. I think, you know, um, Atul may be right in some of these patients, but, you know, and I, th I think you really can't I'm say that. I'm not saying that. some of these patients, Salman. I'm saying in all <laughs> of these patients. We have to prove it. Okay, and let's prove no it. No proof. You know, it is a publication and it is in uh, neurosurgery, Journal of Neurosurgery, sure. and also in several other pub um, forums. So you cannot neglect or ignore a published article. That is a, no, no, that no. Is a bottom line. We're not article. saying that. No, I'm just saying that um, you know, in some of these patients, every patient has a different pathology, and when you look at not okay, every Salman, patient. Okay, Salman, just let me, because it is important, because it is yeah, important, sure. let me make some more comments. See, our psyche, our lifelong psyche in spine surgeon is that compression is the problem, decompression is the treatment, this psyche has to be changed. Compression is not the issue, compression is not the problem. Compression is secondary. Compression is a radiological phenomenon. It is secondary to vertical spinal instability. And one must try to understand this new concept. And this new concept will not be taken by everybody just like that when somebody is saying, yeah, yeah I agree. I was doing decompression for 50 years. Now I say, it is, it is not going to happen that, like that. But it is a right forum for me to give my philosophy, sure. give my concept which is not based on one or two or three patients, which is based on multiple patients over several years. So you please try to think about it. Maybe you don't agree. It is not necessary that everybody should agree and everybody should say, yeah, 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 yeah very good, very good. Nobody should agree, but at least there is a point to think about. Sure, we'll do that. Mehmet? Yes, I know that concept, but uh, actually, uh, Atul is also doing a different type of uh, fixation, uh, facet uh, distraction fixation. No, no, not, no, Mehmet, uh, no, not facet distraction. Pedicle I'm screw fixation? No, no, no pedicle screw. It is transarticular facetal fixation. Cannula yeah, transarticular facetal fixation. Sorry, yeah, I must correct it. But uh, how, what do you think about pedicle screw fixation? Medical screw fixation also can be done. The concept remains the same. Concept, the technique, you change the uh, type of fixation does not really matter. But you know what I do is, in, earlier I used to introduce intrafacetal spaces, as you know. Intra, I did, used to distract and put intrafacetal spaces. The concept was that it reduces the vertical instability and stabilizes. But as I progress in this business, I realize that there is no need for even distraction, only fixation. And facets are the strongest point of the whole vertebra. Pedicles are not. Vertebrate body is not. Facets are the strongest. You hold the bone, the facets are like rock. Vertebral body is not like a rock. Pedicle is not like a rock. So transarticular fixation, a technique devised by Camille is the best technique for fixation. And that is my concept. Okay. Uh, Doug? Okay. Um, bullshit. <laughs> no, no facet question. fixation, yeah, biomechanic, can... facet fixation biomechanically when tested is inadequate um, for true stability. Um, creating fusions um, increases adjacent segment degeneration, particularly if you aren't restoring alignment when you create your fixation when you do your fixation and, and facet fixation does not alter alignment. Um, you know, it's, yes, there are some patients who will get better that way, but, but this idea that, you know, we have had the, the, the long history of success of decompression alone. Um, to me, the morbidity in the long term of fusing people uh, or stabilizing people does not make sense for something where we can do a relatively small, minimally invasive decompression, which has the best proven results in the literature for 50 years. But Doug, you know what you said, right? 
that they have effect and they are being treated. But there can be a change in idea, there can be a change in thought, and to say bullshit and all this is kind of a retrogressive the, thing. Show you know me, what, Doug? Show Doug, me the randomized control. No, we, no, no, we're, doing, we're doing science no, here. I used to, we are I, doing science know, here, at all. The whole we're doing world science was, here. Yeah, yeah, show of course. This is pub, these are published tool. articles I, in the journal of There's bullshit history. published in the journals all over the place. Maybe we can, well, because we can it's uh, in a journal, see a few cases. And maybe based on the cases, we can discuss what we show can do and what we... No, no, other other thing. Shall we progress to some cases, someone? I think let's Wait. move on. Uh, we, let's let's, just, let's, let's talk. Nice let's one, talk one, a lot. Nice this, this subject, no, no. So I, told, one uh, point. Like this, I just want to make one yeah. point. Sure, sure, sure. Atul, when you have done a 500 patient randomized controlled trial showing that your mechanism, your method is better, I will believe it. I have until you have shown idea. me, I have until you've shown me an equivalent of the sports study. I have. Multi-center randomized it control is on trial. You whether you accept it or you don't accept it, or if you have a you know air of superiority in your character, that is different. No, no, no. no. But you know what? Uh, uh, told, I'm sorry. Sorry. No, no. Let's, don't let's let's randomized you control nobody trial. For me to that show. is the standard. I, have, I have no. You. Are, I have not to prove to you what I have to. I have to say and what I don't have to say. I have published my dear friends, twenty friends, articles. Please. You see in those articles. I don't yeah, have sure. to prove. I, I think obviously we can't discuss this in, in this um, uh, uh, webinar alone because the subject is completely different. But um, I think what we need to do is we, uh, we all need to discuss this yes, read up and then have a discussion. It will, it, will not be, it will not get solved in this webinar alone. So I think let's, is, let's move this on. Is, let's, this let's, is let's... eternal topic like to be or not to be. So it's going <laughs> to be always. Uh, uh, that's what I discussed when I suggested, when Mehmet suggested this topic. My comment was, this is a topic like, you know, the Shakespeare's question, to be or not to be. So, and I don't think we will uh, find the uni, uh, the unequivocal answer anytime soon. So maybe we can uh, see now a few cases, someone. What do you think? I mean, yes, we sure. Um, yeah, we can start with Stacy. Stacy. Stacy is going to show a case and then we get the duck to show some cases for us. Stacy, can we unmute Stacy and make her? Yeah, yeah she's uh, our okay. co-host. So, okay. okay. Sorry, I, yes. Play some mute, Stacy. Great, she, thank she you. Is... Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You're welcome. Stacy is from Dublin, now working in, uh, working in Dublin at the moment, yeah. Yeah, so she's, uh, she's a senior fellow at the minute in uh, Dublin. And, Thank you uh, for the doing, chance to present. Uh, senior fellowship in uh, spinal surgery. Stacy, please continue. So this is a lady who presented to our clinic just a couple of weeks ago. She's a 50-year-old lady who presents with some very mild back pain, which is a bit mechanical and sounding, um, and some bilateral leg pain. But the more worrying feature was that of several weeks worth of fecal incontinence. So obviously the mind has to go to things like cauda equina. So this was the MRI scan that she presented with. And as you can see, she's got a four or five sort of grade one spondy, a bit of ligamentum hypertrophy, a bit of central canal stenosis. Um, but nothing that you would say definitely uh, uh, a cauda equina. So from what uh, Professor Zavelli has gone through today, you would say obviously she's female. So she has sort of decision making in terms of fusion versus decompression. Um, she's likely to progress. She has radicular pain. She has back pain. Um, so as a practice for us, we get um, standing flexion extension views. And if I can click this on. So you can see she has quite marked instability. So this was actually quite an easy decision making process for the to fuse or not to fuse. So as you can see her flex X views are really quite unstable um, and certainly would explain some more of her some some of her symptoms. So when she was admitted uh, from the clinic, uh, she was in Asia L1D, and she went on to theater. Uh, okay, the so, so Stacey, day. Stacey, hold on, hold on. Uh, let's let's get let's get some opinion from people out there, um, guys. Uh, what do you think? What you, what are you going to do from here? Have you got any takers? Uh, anybody who wants to take this case, raise your hand and we'll unmute you so we can hear from you. How are you going to solve this case? Stacy, just briefly tell us again of what's happening with this case again so that people can raise their hands who want to answer. 
50 year old female with mild back pain and um, some bilateral radicular symptoms uh, some faecal incontinence for a number of weeks intermittently she's quite a high demand patient and um, she's otherwise fit and well she's working full time um, and she's a pre-op, she's Asia L1D neurologically. Okay, any takers? So Pragnesh Bhatt wants to answer. So let's see, let's unmute Pragnesh. Uh, Imad, can you unmute Pragnesh, please? Uh, yes, sir, I'm, I'm trying. He, he has to unmute. Yeah, he's Hello. Unmuted. Are you able to hear me? Yes, Pagnesh, we can. Welcome. Good afternoon and good evening. Thank you very much, Salman and all the faculty. I would do L45 decompression and fusion because there is severe stenosis. I would do a standard open post approach, wide decompression to give the benefit to for the cord equina decompression and uh, do a standard post fusion. What I'm not sure is whether I'll be able to put a kgs uh, because I need to look at the MRI back to see the disc height. But my plan would be to do a good decompression and a posterior pedic uh, fixation. I can okay. see that there is a disc height, though, so I would try to insert kgs as well. Uh, there are There is somebody who said about dynamic fusion. So, uh, Doug, what do you think about dynamic fusion here? Sorry, you need to be unmuted. Okay, there yes. we go. Um, I, I, dynamic fixation means many different things. Um, so I, I would need to be a little more clear. Um, one, th one of the common, you know, commonly used dynamic fixation techniques, the denesis. Um, the denesis was subjected to a FDA sponsored IDE trial. Uh, and it was shown to be inferior to fusion in degenerative spinal thesis. Okay, right. Um, any more takers? Do we have anybody else who wants to take this? So Pragnesh wants to do a fixation and plus minus cage, or maybe play T lift, uh, whichever way. Um, Nikolai, what would you do? Aftab Yunus from South Africa wants to say something. So can we unmute Aftab Yunus, please? Imad, can we please? Unmute. Aftab, are you there? He's unmute. Okay, can I? Yeah, yes. thank you. Yes, Aftab, uh, please. I think, uh, um, think for giving me opportunity. Um, first of all, it's a dynamic instability, you know, um, uh, dynamic. Uh, uh, you know, fusion is contraindicated in this case. So uh, I will do a P lift with the single segment fusion, posterior fusion. Um, but I do MIS uh, through um, tubular retractor. You can put a cage in there and also you can do a minimally invasive spinal fusion uh, on in this case. So that will be my approach for this case. So Aftab, you're going to do T lift or P lift? With minimally uh, I'll put in a P. Uh, I usually what I do is I put in a T lift um, um, from the side uh, as well. Uh, P lift um, uh, got a lot of complications, so I prefer to do sure. a T lift than P lift. Okay, so Thank let's you. see what Stacy did. So yes, there was instability. So so right, this is our intra op. So obviously we went on to fuse, and so we did not do minimally invasive because the consultant I was with did not doesn't really do a lot of minimally invasive. So it was an open procedure, decompression, fusion from the back with pedicle screws as well as interbody fusion with a T lift. And um, I know that talk about um, the sort of open procedures taking longer to go home. So she was neurologically Asia E the day after surgery uh, and she went home day two. Okay, any comments? The only thing that I can uh, comment to that is uh, uh, there is, it would be good if we can see, I, in these cases, dynamic MRI scan. So if there was a dynamic MRI scan, I am sure that 
especially seeing the dynamic x-rays, you see significantly reduced uh, cross-section of the spinal cord. And that probably can explain the, uh, the neurological symptoms, most likely. So I think this was a good solution, minimal invasive or open. Uh, Professor Zilili said that in the long term. And the end goal is, um, is uh, uh, more or less similar and whatever works in your hands. In my hands, this will be minimal invasive, but we can see that open works pretty well as well. So it's a matter so of if, choice. So Nicolai, many young people would be asking this, this patient has got severe problems, you know, cord equina. Uh, would you still do minimally invasive? Yes, because uh, probably uh, if you deeply start asking this patient, probably this patient will tell you that uh, he has problems only when the patient is upright, because when the patient is upright, that slip happens. You can see that when the patient is uh, uh, in a supine position on the MRI scan, the, the situation is not so bad. But when you see the standing x-rays, you see significant slip there. And that is probably what's contributing for significant compression of the of the of the neural structures. So yes, I would do minimal invasive, and in my hands, I think this will work uh, good. And I have similar cases I can show. Okay, okay. Mehmet, are you there? Would you be able to uh, comment on this, please? Yes, actually, uh, I would do the same surgery. Yeah. Okay, good. Interbody fusion plus short fixation. Okay, very good. Thank just, you, Stacey. That just was to be, wonderful. Just, yeah. just to be contrary, and another option here. So probably with the, deg the degree of central stenosis, I probably wouldn't. But a lot of these patients with dynamic instability, dyna um, dynamic compression, essentially, uh, another really good option is an A-lift with percutaneous screws. Yeah. Um, so you, you'd consider indirect decompression even if somebody is cauda equina? I wouldn't with cauda equina. That's what I said. So what I do is I look and do they have, is their dominant stenosis foraminal and lateral recess? If their dominant stenosis is foraminal and lateral recess, I will consider doing a, an anterior interbody of some form with percutaneous screws. If they have severe central stenosis, I, I tend to do them as, as a T-lift. Okay, so uh, thank you, everybody. I think we move on to cases. Uh, Doug, have you got some cases to show us? Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, if you would let me share my screen. Share screen, here we go. Okay, so I've got three cases. I sort of did this as a, as a you know, hoping that Mehmet would say a lot of the things that he did say. And so I sort of picked the cases. Um, so the first one, this is a 64 year old male. He complains of activity related bilateral lower extremity paresthesias, unsteadiness and weakness. He actually says it doesn't really hurt. He just can't walk very far because his legs get all wobbly. Um, his walking tolerance is less than hundred meters. His standing tolerance is five minutes. These are upright x-rays. And then I'm gonna go through his MRI. Um, what you can see, that's a mid-sagittal um, T2. And then axial T2s, this is L1, 2, L2, 3, L3, 4, and L4, 5. So what do people wanna do? Okay, anybody wants Does anybody to want any other see? investigations? Anybody wants to raise their hands and answer? Can you Any show us again the three level while we are waiting? Okay, the, it's actually four levels. Here's L1, okay. 2. Okay. L2, 3, L3, 4, <laughs> and L4, 5. L5, S1, widely patent. T12, L1, widely patent. So it's just these four. So Vinod Kumar says we need MRI of dorsal spine. Um, the MRI of the thoracic spine is fine. Okay, Pragnesh wants dynamic x-rays. Okay. So here's flexion extension views. Looks good. Yeah. 
Okay, so we have uh, stability. Oh, another here. point I wanted to bring up on flexion extension views. Um, actually, no, I'll bring it up later. Never mind. It's okay. So, what do people want to do? Sorry, uh, Doug, is there any lateralization of the symptoms or is it just it's, bilateral? No, it's bilateral. And is there any weakness or is it just pain? He has, he has no documented weakness, but he, has, he perceives his legs get weak. He says if he stands and walks, his legs feel weaker and they get wobbly. But if you just test him statically in, in the exam room, he's five out of five power. Um, what I will do sometimes in these people is have them go walk and, and walk 100 meters and then re-examine them. And sometimes you will find that after they've walked for a little while, they do have a little bit of true weakness. And how old so was that patient? Sorry? How old was the patient? 64. 64. Otherwise completely healthy. What about the spine balance? That's the question. Do we need whole spine x-rays? So whole spine x-rays. So again, it's interesting. He... He went on clinical exam, you can easily get him to stand in neutral sagittal and coronal balance, but not for very long. He really always wants to be leaning forward. Okay, but, okay. But, but scoliosis films, he is able to stand in neutral sagittal and coronal balance. Okay, Stacy says no back pain, but logication no symptoms, actual, No actual pain. De decompression only. Decompression only. I There's a suggestion that. regarding a brain assessment. Why would you do brain assessment with that clear a pathology? In fact, it is it is almost the same that I have shown during my talk. Yeah. Uh, for the uh, compression. Yeah. Yeah. This site is, is quite narrow and there is no instability, there is no back pain. Uh, so just the compression. It may be even done uh, with an open surgery or, or minimally invasive. The, probably the patient is leaning forward because he's decompressing like that for the foramina. And oh, that's absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So just decompression will be perfectly okay. I agree with that. So MIS are open? That depends on the preference. <laughs> I think dealer's choice. No need for fixation. There are still... Yeah. There are some suggestions from the audience. This is a typical case that there is no need for fixation. So I think to, to some extent, I think one of the things is it, when you, there are decompressions and there are decompressions. I think if you were to do a four level complete laminectomy, that would have a, a relatively high incidence of, of failure. And particularly, I would be worried about progression of the degenerative scoliosis. Um, I think that if you can preserve the midline structures, um, either by doing uh, bilateral keyholes or unilateral approach, bilateral decompression, I think that, that a multi-level decompression is, is a, a very good op is probably the better option here. Okay. There is if also slight arguing, rotation. That, that, there come some uh, suggestions from the audience, uh, multiple laminectomies. Uh, actually, I don't accept in the current knowledge to make multiple laminectomies for a patient like this. Yeah, and it, the administration the, and you must do. The, the reason I, I've always liked, disliked laminectomies is that as you look here, if you look in between where the lamina is, he's not stenotic. So laminectomy um, is faster. Um, you know, you, you can you can do it much much more quickly. Um, but but you're essentially decompressing areas that don't that aren't compressed. And so that's why I think just interlaminar decompressions are are a better way to go. And and also it's um, whether people do what I notice at least in North America is whether people do midline preserving uh, decompressions or not is a function of how many revisions they do. The more revision surgeries you do in your, in your practice, the more likely you are to preserve the midline because I'm always thinking anytime I do an operation, okay, if there's another operation, what am I gonna do? And boy, if I've preserved the midline structures, it is way easier to do the next operation than if they've had a complete laminectomy. Yeah.
Okay, their question is, what about D12 um, L1? Could that be calcified disc? Um, there, there isn't. This is, the, because of the scoliosis, this is a little off center. Um, when you actually look, and that, that's actually tw uh, 11, 12, um, we did do a thoracic MRI and there is no compression. Okay, good. Okay. So everybody Next agrees? One. Yeah. Next one. Okay. It's a 58 year old male. He's got a one year history of activity related back pain. And the back, the back pain is that claudicant type back pain I was talking about. When he is sitting or when he's getting in and out of bed, he has no back pain. The back pain is only when he's standing or walking. Um, bilateral lower extremity pain, slightly worse on the left than the right. His walking tolerance is limited to 200 meters. His standing tolerance is about 10 minutes. Um, he has tried anti-inflammatories, uh, pregabalin, physical therapy. He's had epidural injections, which provide about two weeks of really good pain relief, but not durable relief. Here are his x-rays and his MRI. So anybody want anything else? Okay, any comments, please? Nobody commenting. Hmm. Okay, clearly there is a open facet sign there. Uh, even on the MRI scan, you can see that there is uh, uh, a degree of listhesis at L4, L5, which corresponds uh, actually, to the actually in the MRI, he doesn't have a listhesis at four or five. Well, there he's is a hint attempt. for that. He's he, he's <laughs> he's neutral. He's neutral in the supine position. Yes. And listhetic, and that was uh, eight or nine millimeters in the standing position. Yeah. So okay. th this is one point I wanted to bring up. Um, the the and I wish I could remember the the reference but you are substantially more likely to detect spondylolisthesis comparing a supine to a standing study than you are a standing flexion extension. Yeah. So, so in, in a case like this, I, I was wondering if people were gonna ask for flexion extension. This is one where you don't need flexion extension. You know this is unstable. I agree with you. This for me will be a single level fixation, um, some sort of interbody fusion. Yeah, and, and this to me is the perfect patient, though that's not what I did for this patient. Um, historically, um, the, or now this is a patient in whom I, I would do this as, as an ALIF and percutaneous screws. Okay, Mamet. I understand in on the flexion extension, there is no movement. I didn't do flexion extension because there is movement just comparing this supine image to a standing image. He has nine millimeters of instability. Okay. Okay, but I would, I would rather, uh, he had, the patient has back pain additionally. Claudicant yeah. pattern back pain, yes. Yeah. I would rather do a short fixation with Tilif. Yep, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And in fact, that's what I did with this guy. I did this as an MIS T-lif, but as I'm saying now, I would have done this as an A-lif with percutaneous screws. Okay, it's another we, option. Yeah, we, we know that Doug does a lot of A-lifts, he's used to that. And so as somebody who's used to that, should you know do whatever it's, works best in their hands. Yes, the one, Fusion technology I would not use here is this is one where I would not use a transoas lateral. And the reason for that is that this is the so-called Mickey Mouse ears sign. The, ver the psoas is anteriorly shifted on the disc space. And so that in order to get at the disc, you're in the posterior third of the of the psoas and so the the chance of an l3 nerve root palsy even with monitoring is very very high here so this is one where i would not do a trans psoas fusion 
Dr. Can I Olive? ask you, you what is... Olive, oh, sorry, Olive is difficult here because of Mickey Mouse appearance of the it's, source? Olive is harder um, than, and um, again, it's very difficult with the, the psoas that anteriorly um, to do the Olive, uh, but it, it's better than going trans psoas. What is your indication for Alif and why you prefer Alif instead of Tilif? Uh, for me, Alif, three reasons. Um, one, highest fusion rate of any fusion going. If you're going to do a fusion, you might as well do the one with the highest fusion rate. Um, two, it, with a mini open technique, um, you know, this is a one night hospital stay. Um, in standalones, I've actually had patients go home same day with a standalone Alif, um, so outpatient surgery. Um, and it just, it, in this type of patient without central stenosis, it, it, in my hands, it gives good results. Okay, good. Let's move on. Okay, and then this is the last one. Oh, there's the foraminal view. So this is, it, at this time I did this, I had actually done this one as a minimally invasive T-lift. Oh, sorry, that was the third thing. Um, and that this x-ray reminds me. Um, the other reason I do A-lifts is it restores lordosis better. Um, and, and I think that the restoration of lordosis is that's the adjacent segment degeneration is some of it is natural history of the disease, but I think a lot of it is not the fact that we're fusing people. It's the position we're fusing them in. And what I, I hate about this x-ray is in this standing film, top of L4 is not parallel to the floor. Have you tried to expand the ball cages? Um, I, I actually, the biggest thing I've done if with my T-lifts is I've, I've stopped using the straight ahead cages because the straight ahead cages like this one is, um, they give you the lordosis you're going to get. And I've gone exclusively to crescent shaped cages as far forward in the disc as possible. And then compressing down with a bilateral facetectomy, um, in, in my T-lift patients to get the yeah. lordosis. On top of that, you can have also some expandable technology. And the problem so with expandable that. cages is that in the United States, an expandable T-lift cage is $5,000. My peak crescent cage is $500. My hospital's profit margin, and, and in the American system, that's important, my hospital's profit margin on a one-level T-lift is about $2,000. So as soon as I use an expandable cage, my hospital loses money. It's amazing how different places are different different uh, countries. In the UK, the expandable uh, cages vary around two thousand, so it's not this expensive. Yeah, still expensive. Still expensive, yeah. Comparing to uh, yeah, but I just can't rationalize the excess cost. Yeah, I think the results are the same at the moment. Yeah. Okay, this is the last one. This is an eighty-year-old woman. She's coming in with bilateral, um, slightly worse on the right, anterior thigh pain with activity. Um, walking is limited to 50 meters, standing limited to five minutes. Here are her x-rays. And these two axial cuts are just below the disc and at the level of the disc. And you can see that she has the set cysts here and here. So what do people okay, want to do? Any takers? What are we going to do? What do you need any other investigation? Dynamic. Okay, so I actually did do sense. I actually did do flex X on her, and there's really only about a millimeters difference between the flexion and extension, so, maybe so two. not much happening. Okay, not so much. Yeah. So where do we go from here? Any more takers? So, Alessandro says just decompression. Uh, steroid injections. She had steroid injections. They helped for about a week. And Which Carlos level? Carlos is saying That's percutaneous. Percutaneous fixations. Ozer says injections only. Did, what only injections worked. did you have exactly? What she, injections did you do? 
she she had a bilateral L34 transforaminal epidural. Okay. But that's an answer there. Work felt great for a week. That's pretty diagnostic there. So your conservative treatment in this patient, how long would it be if you're so going to do conservative a, a, treatment? Another, another option to mention when you're doing injections in patients with facet cysts is there's actually a growing literature on um, essentially injecting the facet joint and filling it full of fluid and actually bursting the cyst. But there is also I, I, literature suggesting suggesting that if you see a cyst that is potentially unstable. Yep. That's why yeah. I'm presenting this particular case. <laughs> so there are, there, are, there are a lot of um, uh, studies now coming from Korea uh, regarding minimally invasive uh, transforaminal decompression and taking the cyst at the same time and not fusing and saying that results are reasonable, but the numbers are really small at the moment. And with no control group. With no control group. Mehmet? Um, yeah, in, in 80 years old, we must be cautious uh, for doing uh, uh, fixation surgery uh, because she must have osteoporosis at this age, a lady. I'm not sure what to do. <laughs> Yeah, okay, really. show, show so do you have you do you have um, have you measured the the bone density here? I I have not um, on this case. If I was contemplating doing a fusion, I would have gotten a bone density. Right. So you're betraying your decision now. You're saying <laughs> that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. I I. So felt... there's a question about cannulated screws. Yes, cannulated screws plus uh, augmentation could be an option if uh, somebody wants to fuse in that age and is concerned about uh, uh, bone density, obviously. Treating the osteoporosis is a better option. Well, but you need a lot of time for that. So, if you, you know, I think particularly in my deformity patients now, um, if they're osteoporotic and I'm con contemplating a deformity surgery, they're all going on an anabolic agent um, such as uh, teriparatide or abaloparatide or rosuzumab. Um, if they're really miserable, I put them on that for three months. If they can tolerate it, I put them on it for six months and sometimes even a year before I operate on them. Yeah, I think generally what I do is three months and then they can continue afterwards as well. Yeah. Ipan, yeah, from, Ipan from Indonesia is saying that injection with pulsed radio frequency or on DRG. Not well, familiar we, with well, that. Just so, one week of uh, of uh, relief of her symptoms. Did you say that after the injection? Yeah, one week after the injection. So, so I did this as a as a bilateral keyhole for aminotomy, um, and um, she was doing really really well for about the first eight months, uh, and I just saw her back this week, and she actually now does have a mobile spondylolisthesis. So yes, I'm getting her bone density tested because I have a feeling she's now having true mechanical back pain. Um, and I think that, that in spite of trying to preserving everything in the midline, um, I think just she's gone on to develop an, an instability. So yes, they do develop. There is a lot of publications coming from you as about uh, measuring the health field units on a CT yeah. scan and then deciding, do you believe in that? And what's your Absolutely, practice? I do. Um, what it, is your it, cutoff? So, um, so for those of you who don't know it, what you do is, is on your image, your, image, your image software, there's usually the ability to capture an ellipse. Yeah. Um, and what you do is at the, mid, at the level, level of the pedicle, you do an ellipse where you're not touching cortical bone and it'll give you an average Hounsfeld units within that ellipse. And what is your under, cutoff? Anything under 135 is osteopenia. Anything under 105 is osteoporosis. Um, when are you going to augment? Sorry? When are you going to augment? If you Almost see never. <laughs> I, I probably haven't augmented pedicle screw fixation 
Um, certainly, I, I can't ever recall augmenting a single level pedicle screw instrumentation. Um, and if I do augment, um, it's on my deformity patients. And I augment UIV and UIV plus one. I don't do any more than that. And the reason for that is if they fail, you've now taken a, a problem and made it a potential disaster. Um, because with the cement augmented screws, particularly the fenestrated screws, in the really bad osteoporotics, you take them, you, you try and take that screw out to reinstrument them, to add on levels, and you can just completely destroy the vertebral body. And now you're dealing with an osteoporotic patient who needs a corpectomy. Um, so no, I, I rarely use on, on single level degeneratives. Um, and, and if I do use them in, in uh, deformity long constructs, I'm only doing UIV and UIV plus one, or if it's a, a thoracic where you know I'm coming down, um, I'll do the LIV and LIV plus one. Would you aim bicortical here in that case, if you have to instrument and in, ca in case the patient is uh, with bad bone quality? So it, it's, if you look at the, um, if you read the product inserts on intervertebral body cages, they say not to be used in osteoporosis because when they did the IDE trials, they, that was an exemption. Um, there's a beautiful study done by Dave Pauly looking at rigidity of constructs and finding actually, particularly if you can get a interbody spacer in the front, in the anterior third of the disc space, you create a very, a much better, more rigid. Um, so actually I, all, all, most people say osteoporosis is a contraindication to interbody fusion. I actually think it's an indication. Um, so I, rather than, rather than cement augmenting, particularly in somebody like this, where the disc is relatively tall, Rather than cement augmenting the screws, I would rather get interbody support anteriorly. Okay, uh, there's a question on the chat, which is there for some time. So I'm sorry, I'll ask it again. Uh, it's um, what is the outcome of spinous process splitting procedure in lumbar spinal stenosis? Is it any useful mammoth? You want to take this? If you split the spinous process, so you're keeping the muscles intact and you open it like you do it in cervical spine. Yeah, I'm not against this, but I have no experience with that. I didn't do it. Splitting the spinous processes. Actually, uh, even in the cervical spine, uh, it is quite uh, technically demanding. It must be more technically demanding in lumbar spine. Why okay, do you uh, try so difficult things instead of doing uh, just fenestrations or uh, minimally invasive unilateral approach bilateral decompensions. Okay. Yeah. Atul, I didn't... if you are there, okay, if you can Sorry. have a comment from Atul before we wrap up. Sorry, Doug, you carry on in the minute. Atul? Oh, what I was going to say, um, the, the, this is one where um, bitter personal experience, I would not in this one do a unilateral approach, bilateral decompression. Um, because the, it, the bilateral facet cysts, there's so often you'll get these where they're tightly adherent to the dura. And, and I can just imagine getting that terrible contralateral durotomy doing that. So that's why I did this as bilateral fenestrations. You, okay. uh, Salman, you want me to make a comment and create yes, another please. controversy? No, 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 don't create controversy. <laughs> but, you can, you but can comment. I'll tell it's you fine. what, you know what, in this case, you know, whether you take it or you don't take it, that is on individual. But this patient, you know what is happening in this guy? Is This is an old man. It's an old woman, having... actually. Woman, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, you know what? There is no, not much compression as such. What is happening is his muscles have become weak and there is an instability. My concept is that these cysts that you are seeing, this facetal thickening and whatever osteophyte in the region of facets, this bulging of the disc, this reduction of the disc spaces that you're seeing at multiple levels, some kind of listesis that you are seeing between the bodies. These are all a result of instability. And this guy... We can't hear you at all. This person... Oh, you can hear me now? Yeah, it's better. 
just a minute, just a minute. This bulging of the this this osteophyte formation, this cyst formation in the joints, this hyperostosis and this joint, you know, this weakness of the facets, this listhesis of the body are all secondary. My concept is that these are all secondary to muscle weakness and facetal, vertical facetal instability. There will be no instability on dynamic imaging, but there is instability and that is the genesis of the entire problem. There is no need to do any decompression. All these changes that you are seeing are all secondary to multi-segmental instability. And this person will improve by, I do transarticular camelase technique of multi-level. I will fix him from L1 to L5. And that will be my technique. And believe me, you know, you don't have to, I'm giving you a thought and I'm giving you my experience. 100% this patient will have symptomatic relief, which will be lasting and which will be permanent. I know it is not a accepted concept and not a very popular concept because it is a new concept. But this new concept, believe me, Doug, you are my friend for a long time. Don't be upset. This concept which I am proposing is here to stay and here to stay for long. And this is my you know, last sentence that I'm giving to you. I know I don't want to create a controversy. I'm not. You know, I said decompression is not necessary in craniovertebral junction. Many people said bullshit and all those things. And I'm used to, I said decompression is not necessary for Chiari malformation. And many people have not only criticized me, they have thrown stones on me. But I am absolutely sure that Chiari malformation, you don't need decompression. For lumbar canal stenosis, I am absolutely sure. And over 10 years, my experience is I don't need any certificate from anybody. This patient needs multi-segmental stabilization, no decompression of the cyst, no decompression from front. This patient needs fixation. Okay, Mehmet. Thank you, Atul. Mehmet. I know. I'm sorry, for Doug. Don't worry, my friend. Give me a smile and get done. I... <laughs> it's always fun sparring with you at all. Uh, well, uh, uh, but uh, multiple level fixations uh, may create uh, new problems, especially adjacent level disease. Uh, we must uh, have a long follow ups of those. If, if, if you fuse from L1 to L5, especially. Uh, shorter fixations are better, as I have stressed during my talk. Thank you. Okay, uh, um, uh, Doug, could you please unshare the slides or, or show us what you did? I uh, know this I, is what you did. I, I okay. told you I did. I, yeah. I did. Okay. I I did for Ams, um, so I didn't have a post op um, until I saw her this week, and and I don't have her new X rays. But yes, she now has a mobile spondylolisthesis, and okay. I'm repeating the MRI. Um, to see if there's anything else I need to be worried about or whether I'm just going to go ahead and stabilize her. My current plan for stabilizing her, if the MRI shows what I think it's going to show, which is not really any central stenosis, just the instability would be a transoas lateral and percutaneous fixation. Okay, agree. Um, can we, uh, Imad, can you show us the uh, MCQs, please? And Mamat, you can take these MCQs away, please. Yes. Amount of stiffness below, which is not appropriate for minimally with spine surgery. Uh, the A is... is uh, Imad, can you please show us the full question? Maybe just, yeah, that's it. A is the correct answer. So at the moment, it's the superiority is not known. Okay. Namath. Uh, which feature below do not fit complex lumbar spine stenosis? Yes, sagittal facet orientation and severe fa facet denervation. 
correct answer must be B. And lumbar spine stenosis patient, which factor below has less value for fusion indication? Yes. Yes. Preserve this kind. Okay. Sorry. Less value for fusion indication. Yes. Actually, you can consider as for female gender. There is there is some uh, confusion here, but yeah, I accept this. Preserve this kind. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. There are only three questions I have sent. Okay, brilliant. Um, Mehmet, I think the overall the talk was very nice. We really enjoyed it. Say hello to Bernard in the, in the background. Uh, Thank you. And, and enjoy your uh, dinner, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and um, and uh, Nicola, your comments, Doug, your comments before we close. Oh, very good talk, Mehmet. Thank you. Thank very you, good Doug. talk and very yeah, interactive welcome. presentations and case discussions. And I think we really had a good discussion today, uh, which, uh, you know, it became uh, heated up to an extent. And this is uh, always a good thing. You know, when we, when we discuss, we get the, the truth. So let's see when will be the truth in the future. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Okay. Can, we have, can we just have a group photograph? Everybody switch on your video so we can have a group photograph. Imad, can you please take pictures? Everybody switch on uh, their videos. And I need a big smile from Atul and Doug both. <laughs> Thank you. Nicola, you can smile. It's OK. I am smiling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. And in a fortnight, um, hopefully, we will have um, uh, Professor Zem Chen and um, uh, Yoko Morotel um, taking us through, and we would have the same team uh, helping us. Yes, sir. everybody, welcome. Okay. Are you done with pictures? I'm Have out. a good week, everybody. Yes, sir. I'm done. Yes, sir. It's done. Okay. Can I stop um, smiling now? Yes, yes, you can stop smiling now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank okay. you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Really enjoyed that. Um, and I think a bit of um, argument is always good for science. Okay.